I'd like to call the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, June 15th, 2023 to order. All would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Clerk Soul, would you please call the roll? President Ballerine. Check it out. President Ballerine. Here. Trustee Gallagos. Here. Trustee Mateo. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Marshazka. Here. Manager Francis. Here. Attorney Pickerel. Here. Also present, Clerk Soul. Thank you. First on the agenda tonight is the President's report, and I have a couple of things. Um, before I ask Trustee Evans to read the Juneteenth Proclamation, I wanted to take a moment to, to address this important occasion that is, awful under, that is often un, overlooked and under-celebrated, which is Monday, Juneteenth. Tonight, I would like to share my thoughts on the significance of Juneteenth and why it deserves our attention and support. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, commemorates the liberation of enslaved African Americans in the United States. On June 19, 1865, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas and pro proclaimed the end of slavery two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Juneteenth represents a pivotal moment in American hi history signifying the emancipation of enslaved people. For many of us within the white community, Juneteenth might not have been widely recognized or even acknowledged until recent years. However, it is crucial for us to understand that Juneteenth holds immense importance for all Americans, irrespective of our racial or ethnic background. Juneteenth serves as a reminder of the systemic injustices that have plagued our nation. Recognizing the past and its impact on the present allows us to reflect on the legacy of slavery and the ongoing struggle for equality. Juneteenth symbolizes hope, resilience, and progress. By acknowledging and commemorating, commemorating this day, we honor the progress made towards racial equality while also recognizing the work that still lies ahead. In conclusion, Juneteenth is a momentous occasion that deserves our attention. Riverside, by resolution, was one of the first communities in Illinois to officially recognize Juneteenth in, as a holiday. I had the honor representing uh, Riverside along with Trustee Mateo by attending a Juneteenth flag raising in River Forest this past Monday. I ask you all, time, all to take time to recognize and educate yourself on the importance of this day. Thank you. Seconds. Juneteenth Proclamation. Whereas Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Sela Liberation Day, is the oldest national day of commemoration in the end of slavery in the United States, and whereas on June 19, 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation was read to newly freed Americans in the state of Texas, where the state of Texas was the last Confederate state to make and accept the pro proclamation, and whereas all 50 states, including the state of Illinois and the District of Columbia, recognized Juneteenth as either a state holiday or day of observance, and whereas Juneteenth commemorates both freedom from slavery in America and recognizes the many contributions African Americans have made to society and to the world, and whereas Juneteenth symbolizes and advances the ideals of freedom from oppression and liberty and justice for all, and whereas Juneteenth celebrations are a tribute to those African Americans who fought for freedom and worked tirelessly to make the dream of equality a reality, and further recognizes that the fight for freedom and equality continues today. And whereas these celebrations set aside time to reflect on and rejoice in the experience of African Americans while emphasizing education, achievement, and unity. And whereas the celebration of Juneteenth is inclusive of all races, ethnicities, religions, and nationalities, and provides the opportunity for all citizens to acknowledge a period in history that has influenced and shaped today's society while recognizing that there is still work to be done. And whereas the village president and board of trustees desire to recognize the historical importance of Juneteenth and its continued relevance across the nation, and specifically within the village, 
And now, therefore, be it resolved that Joseph Ballerine, village president, proclaim that the village of Riverside observe Juneteenth on June 19th, 2023. In witness hereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the village of Riverside this date, this 15th day of June, 2023. Thank you, Trustee Evans. Um, next, I would like to uh, honor a retiring historical commissioner, Diane Scar Saragoli, and I've asked our uh, resident historian board member, Trustee Aberdeen Marsh Osga to do the honor. Diane, if you could go into the back, please. Okay. Well, Diane, this is definitely an, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, all right, I will read the official proclamation here. And then we have a wonderful um, plaque to be presented to you. Is this, is this, do we get Diane's full? Okay, excellent. Diane, Commissioner Diane Saragoli. Whereas Diane Saragoli served on the Riverside Historical Commission for 18 years, from 2005 to 2023, and whereas Diane gladly volunteered her time every Saturday as a host at the Riverside Historical Museum, engaging interested residents and spreading knowledge of the village's rich history. And whereas Diane organized fundraisers to fund and restore the east and west well houses next to the historic water tower, which now serve as exhibits to the historical museum. And whereas Diane assisted in the purchase of an exhibit case for the Riverside Public Library to display artifacts from the museum's historical collection. And Whereas Diane was responsible for the creation of an open sign identifying the historical museum's Saturday business hours, drawing residents and tourists alike into learning more about Riverside. And whereas Diane's dedication, knowledge, and passion for Riverside, especially in preserving the village's rich and unique history, will be greatly missed. And now, therefore, be it resolved, the Village Board sincerely appreciates Diane's many years of service to the Village. In witness hereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the Village of Riverside this 15th day of June, 2023. Oh my goodness. I know. It's been a pleasure, and I, I feel like I'm really not giving up the museum. <laughs> Hopefully, they'll let me in. <laughs> I've enjoyed it so much, and it's such a wonderful village. Uh, I'm so happy that my daughter and family decided to, when she married, would settle here. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for the honor. It was wonderful, and um, I hope I can stay in the village. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. We have uh, a lot of very, very wonderful, dedicated uh, commissioners, and you are by far one of the best, so thank you. Okay, we move on to our manager's report. I do not have a report this evening. Uh, we will move on to resident comments. Are there any resident comments from anyone that is on non-agenda items? Do, we, uh, do you have, do you wanna uh, speak to the board on anything that's not on the agenda tonight? Okay, if you would, I, yeah, I get that. Um, hold on, we'll, we'll make it work for you, hold on. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Ms. Brian just said they'll bring the microphone to you. I have a question on 
It is about the fire code. I own an apartment building in Riverside for over 45 years. And I have judiciously and painstakingly done everything I can possibly do to keep my tenants safe and secure. Oh, over 30 years ago, I was one of the first people to set up the fire alarm system in the building that was required. Now I am told, and I did, put, two, put a fire alarm in each one of the bedrooms. Even though there is a fire alarm in the hallway between the two bedrooms. I consider this a necessary thing for the safety of people, but I don't understand why condominiums do not also do the same thing. In my opinion, a condominium is just a paid apartment. Why don't they have to have fire alarms in the bedrooms? I will pass this to Chief Buckley. Yeah. Okay. So this is in reference to uh, to our rental inspection program. We did verify through a review of appropriate building codes that the state law had changed. We did ver we did notify the entire village through various village channels of the change in state law that requires a smoke detector in each sleeping area. So. This does apply to both single family properties and multifamily properties, in which case the condominium buildings should be installing the smoke detectors for, you know, th that is the state law. And so we think, you know, we think the property owners that are cooperating with the program, especially um, Ms. Pirog, you know, we're, we're trying to work with everyone as we go through and inspect buildings to recommend and encourage safety uh, protocols, especially with smoke detectors and, and carbon monoxide detectors and as such. She, Thank this you. issue is governed by the, uh, the Illinois Smoke Detector Act and the fire code. I'm sorry. This issue is governed by the Illinois Smoke Detector Act and the fire codes as adopted by the village. Now, the Illinois Smoke Detector Act describes where, depending on the nature of the building, whether uh, where all the smoke detector detectors are required to be by law. And uh, this makes no distinction between condominiums and apartments. It doesn't distinguish on forms of ownership. It just distinguishes on single family homes, multi uh, family residences, and identifies where all the smoke alarms need to be. So this is not a, a discretionary matter by the village. If there are uh, individuals you believe are not following the law, I'd appreciate it if you would let us know who those individuals are, but otherwise we are simply uh, acting in accordance with uh, the, the yeah, Illinois Fire why Code. Is, why isn't the inspector going around and saying, put the darn thing in? When our inspectors go through our rental registry, we will do that. We, it's our goal to follow the law, and we will continue to do that. No well, we might not have been in that building yet, but mm -hmm. we will do that. Well, condos are not part of the rental registry program yeah. because but, they are but they, own, owner owned. But yeah, regardless, if there is a, a violation of the law, we are authorized to enforce it either via the rental, rental um, inspection program or otherwise. Uh, be the, and so there's a number of bases in which we can conduct inspections. And so if there is somebody that you, as I said, you know, th th there are individuals who don't comply with the law. That's, you know, that's part of why we have law enforcement. So if you are aware of somebody who is, uh, we appreciate if you let us uh, know where those violations are. So you do an inspection? If there's a violation of the law, we are authorized to do that. I have another complaint. Okay. I just received my. Uh, Here. Here's uh, a I'm sorry. I received my bill for the village water, which is, it's fine. Every two months I get a bill, I pay it. I am now told that I have to pay um, for a new. Um, water meter. What do you call it? Water meter. Water meter. Why? 
because we're changing all the water meters in the village. I'm sorry? We're changing all the water meters in the village. And you're, I think, believe your water meter is $600? No, it's uh, 800 and something dollars. $800 divided by six units. Um, no, my building was built. And when I bought it 40 something years ago, I bought a six unit apartment building that was newly built. After I paid the contractor the money, I received a letter from the village stating that no six unit apartment buildings would be permitted in Riverside. I had to uh, vacate the sixth tenant and I had to convert the whole floor of that apartment to one unit. I sued the builder. I won money. But <laughs> I don't see why I have to have a new meter. How, how, many, I, un how many units let, do you let have? Me, I'm confused. I'm a little okay. upset. It's OK. How, how many units do you have I contacted the, the village of Cicero. Okay. And they told me that they don't charge their people for new meters. If I were to install a new line, I would have to pay. But why do I have to pay for a meter just because you want to change it? And I was told, you don't have enough money to do it. So you're charging the people. You don't get enough tax revenue. So I have to put up 800 and something dollars for a meter. The short answer is, is yes. Um, the short answer is yes, and to be honest with you, that will be the best $800 that you spend in your building. Um, I have already have, have fielded calls from our director who has asked me to, to try to get a hold of a resident whose, whose outdoor hose had burst, and it was flooding his side yard into the street, and he didn't, had no idea that was going on, and, that, and the only reason we found that out was because it pinged his phone because of the new water meters. We were able to go out there and rectify the problem and probably saved him several hundred dollars from just that one incident. We've had houses that have pipes that have burst in the attic. We've been able to identify it quickly before we've had major damages. We've, done, we've helped the school district for a leak that they had, it was leaking on their roof, going into their gutter, down into the sewers. It would have gone on forever without them ever knowing about it. So those meters, are the best investment that the residents of this village can put into their homes. I happily put mine in at $350. Um, so I, I'm sorry, but that's, we don't have the funds to, to spend over a million dollars on new meters. In addition, there is now a rental inspection. And this gentleman goes through one apartment every year checking things. Why? We do that for the safety of the residents of the village. And I understand you you <laughs> you have a very nice he building. He comes in and I pay $55. He tells me what he wants done. I have it done. He comes back. I pay $55 for him to check it. Now, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm not going to have a slum apartment building. I, I appreciate that. Um, but we will continue with our rental registry as, as ordained by the village. You just How come? Because Why haven't you had it all this other time? We just started it a year and a half ago because it was something that we thought was necessary. And this Is it board, that because of Mr. Kafka yeah. and his No, it has, nothing to, do with, it has nothing to do with anybody. It's the right thing to do, and we've done it. So I appreciate your questions, but if we can, we're going to move on. So I mean, I you. do everything for my tenants. I appreciate that. As we, well as myself. Thank you. We can move on to the consent agenda. Clerk Sol. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anyone else that wants? No, oh, sorry, Amy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy from Amy Jacksick 340 Olmstead. I'm here to promote the farmer's market. I'm sure none of you are shocked. <laughs> um, I neglected to come before it started because we were busy planning for it, but we're in our, we're approaching our third week. It's every Wednesday, 2.30 to 7. We have 22 vendors this year, 
And I wanted to thank Ron and his staff in particular. I didn't know he was going to be here tonight. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to come is to thank the village for giving us Ron and Megan part of their time, because I don't think a lot of people realize we work on the market year round. It may seem that it's just from June to October. Every single week, we work on the market pre in preparation for it, including through the winter. And every single market is like a large event for Ron and his staff, including last night when I called him at 6.30 PM with an emergency. And he handled it remotely for me. So there's a small issue that may come up every week. His staff handles it seamlessly. And we've had some issues that we had to get public works involved in. And of course, Ron handled that. And Chief Buckley has had his staff walking through the market. And I sent him an email last night. I was so grateful that um, one of his staff was walking through. And I was super complimentary because he stopped and talked to every single child. They were in awe that he was there, and he took time to talk to every, every resident in its community policing at its finest. It was just lovely. And when I sent him the email, he said, actually, that's a concerted effort. I want my guys walking through the market and making themselves available to residents. So it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to address three things. I haven't spoken to you guys in a while about the market, but I'm sure you guys get the most complaints in the village. So I wanted to give you an idea of why and why we hold the market where we do and the date and the time. So the biggest complaints that I hear from residents are why can't you hold it where there's more parking? And the example we always get is the parking lot across from Riverside Foods. If we hold it there, then there's no parking because that takes up the whole lot. So our vendors would take up the entire lot um, we need to be able to provide them shelter. So in the 14 years we've had the market, we've had to call it twice for weather, where the fire department showed up like I've never seen. They had those tents down like nobody's business, and everybody was brought inside for shelter. We can't assume we can run into Riverside Foods. Like, that's not why they're there. And plus, it would be a real, I mean, as it is, Peter's super supportive of us having the market, but if we had it directly across from him, that's a bit too much. We can't have all those vendors setting up shop across from him every week. The other complaint I get is why can't it be a Saturday market? And I get it. So, so many of us work a traditional Monday through Friday. Riverside's 9,000 plus people. Farmers are not gonna come here on a weekend. They wanna be in Logan Square and Lincoln Park and much larger communities than Riverside, I wouldn't be able to get anybody to come. And then the other complaint I get is hours. So why do we have it 2.30 to 7? Why can't we have it 2.30 to 8.30, that kind of thing? Most of our vendors work the morning also. So there are very traditional market hours. Generally, they're 7 to 1 and then 2.30 to 7. So many of our vendors are already working in the morning, so we can't automatically extend their day for them. They come from all over the place. They want to get on the road. So because of really traditional farmer's market hours, we either need to do that 7 to 1-ish or 2.30 to 7. So that's why we have the hours that we do. So I just wanted to share that with you guys in case you get residents asking, why can't we have a Saturday market like Brookfield? And that's another thing to bring up is Brookfield's in our backyard. They already have a Saturday market. So we're just trying to kind of differentiate ourselves a little bit. So that's it. So thanks to the village, thanks to Ron and his staff, to Public Works and the police department, and to you guys for the support, because you guys have really kind of left me alone for 14 years to do what I do with very little interference. And I'm super appreciative. So thank you for the support. Thank you. Thanks. Amy? I think it'd be awesome to have an FAQ under the farmer's market that addresses every single one They are common questions, so yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's like, so they don't have to bother you guys. I've never heard a complaint about the farmer's market. <laughs> Other than let's, let's start hanging out, Joe. Because yeah. <laughs> I get them all the time. I get texts, I get emails, I get people at the market. So the I understand why people ask those things. 
you know, of course people would prefer it be on a weekend if you work a traditional Monday through Friday. So the I understand. The complaints I get is that the Molly line's too long and somebody <laughs> has to do something about those nuts because it smells up the whole town. Yeah. It just draws people from all over, so. This year's complaint is that the pizza guys are selling out at 6 p.m., so. <laughs> Thank you for the support. Thank I you very much. Anyone else would like to speak? You're on the agenda, okay? We're gonna have, Berkeley is on the agenda, so you'll speak at that time, okay? Okay, anyone else? Okay, hearing none. Ethan, would you please uh, do the consent agenda? Ratify voucher list of bills June 1st, 2023. Approve voucher list of bills June 15th, 2023. Approve Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes May 18th, 2023. Approve Village Board of Trustees executive session meeting minutes May 18th, 2023. Review and file quarterly purchase order report. Review and file community development and public works monthly reports. Review and file police and fire April monthly reports. Review and file historical commission regular meeting minutes April 17th, 2023. Review and file police pension board regular meeting minutes December 5th, 2022. Review and file police pension board regular meeting minutes February 9th, 2023. Review and file economic development commission regular meeting minutes January 11th, 2023. Review and file Parks and Recreation Board regular meeting minutes April 24th, 2023. Review and file Preservation Commission special meeting minutes May 25th, 2023. A resolution authorizing the sale or disposal of personal property owned by the Village of Riverside. And a motion to approve revised Village of Riverside fiscal year 2023 official pay plan. Thank you, Ethan. Is there any trustee or member of the audience that like any of these items removed? Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. Motion is made. Motion by Trustee Gallagher, second. Second. Second by Trustee Marsh Osga. Clerk Sol, would you please call the roll? Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marsh Osga. <clears throat> Aye. Motion carries. We move on to department boards and commission reports. Uh, tonight we have assistant village manager discussing about the demonstration of the building permit online portal. Yes, hello, good evening and thank you. Um, it's a really exciting project. I wanna uh, just do a very quick run through. Uh, I have provided the slides I'm sharing with the board on, on your desk there and we will also be providing uh, either a screen clip of this part of the presentation for future use and, and as a tutorial of sorts for our residents. Um, we decided to spend a couple of um, months with the permitting software in place where people can apply for their permits online to see how it was going uh, before fully rolling it out and introducing it formally to everyone. So thank you to everyone who's worked through the process. It's been a success so far and hopefully it'll continue on that tra trajectory. So um, we have had the software where uh, we call it BSNA. Uh, that's the name in the corner, left-hand corner of the screen when people are applying for a permit. It is affiliated with our village website, so the, the connections are secure and it's going straight to our system. We've had that since 2019 and we use it for our utility billing, our permitting, other financial software system. It's very flexible and comprehensive. It allows us the ability to do a lot of what we need to. And we spent March to April this year reconfiguring the way that it handles our permits in order for us to put it online. So in addition to uh, the current utility billing payments being received and the online, uh, we are also had done this reconfiguration so that we can accept payments for, for building permits and other uh, zoning matters uh, for vehicle stickers and pet licenses, business licenses. That is coming and we're hoping to roll that out in uh, between eight to 10 weeks. It, we're currently in that progress, in that process. I will not read every detail step in, in the next two slides, but it does allow by the online permitting system, allow staff to focus on the quality of submissions and uh, rather than sending paper copies everywhere. Uh, we have transparent access both on the staff side and the user side from the public's uh, perspective. The portal 
is a really nice tool for people to use and get a good look at their own properties or for contractors to be able to, uh, in one place, be able to access all the permits and projects that they're working on. They'll be able to see a lot of information and get plans uh, and other documents. We also realigned our permit types we work a little bit differently than we had even a couple of years ago. And so this process allowed us to update things and even add certain types of inspections. So an example is things like um, you may see and hope, hopefully you will see more tree fencing around parkway trees as we're going through the process of more construction uh, just because it's an important riverside asset and we want to make sure that those things are getting properly protected as we go through new projects. Uh, it's also cut down a little bit on processing time. It allows us to be very specific about project requirements and it eliminates uh, anything getting missed during that process. So again, a lot of words on this page, but the setup included analysis of what we require for each permit. It assigns specific regular reviewers so we know who is looking at the projects. Almost always we have building and zoning reviews, uh, but it also incorporates as a requirement for certain types of projects, the um, you know, public safety review, in-house or, or outside review, engineering in-house or outside, and um, as well as public works. We've aligned our inspection types. Uh, we have the ability now to submit online requests for inspections. So anyone who's logged into the portal is able to schedule a date for or request a date for their permits uh, along that process. And then as well, it's configuring the online payment option. So the fun part, how do you get there and, and how does it work? Uh, you can find our permits page to apply and uh, I listed four different ways. I'm sure there's more ways to find that through navigation of our website, but to using a search bar, using a URL, or navigating to specific pages, you're able to find our permits. When you get to our building permit page, it will show you a variety of, of links. Up at the top, we tried to be very uh, bold in our app, apply for a permit link. Um, below that, we have a series of user help guides, some for contractors, some for uh, residents, and there's also a guide that is very helpful because you need to set up a user account before you begin to apply for your permit. It's not a very challenging or, or tough process, but it's exceptionally helpful and it keeps uh, the property information that's private to you um, in your you know, in your possession. When you click the link for apply for a permit, we get to our BSNA online page. It looks like this, and a lot of what you have is on the left-hand column where people will most likely navigate um, to apply for your permit or see your property activity. Your property should be searched, right? So you enter your address in order to identify the correct property. And as soon as you confirm that, then uh, you go to step two, which is your permit details. You wanna make sure that you have the information necessary for your project. So thinking about things like plans, a site plan or plat of survey may be necessary for your type of project. Uh, you may need, well, you definitely will need a contract or scope of work if you're working with a contractor. And it's also helpful to have any contact information for the contractor as well. So basic information is entered in, in that step. It auto-populates as you choose the type of project you're using. So it'll start um, refreshing the page at certain stages saying, well, now you're, you're selecting a driveway project. What kind of material are you using for your driveway? And it auto-plugs those in and selects your permit uh, with that information. Step three asks you for contact information. So just knowing those basic pieces of information are exceptionally helpful through the process. You can add a person to your, uh, to your project. So if you're a resident or a contractor but need to notify someone else for all the stages of the project, that's the step that it would be entered. Step four uh, is a screen on our system. It's for estimating permit fees. 
Riverside because we have so many different types of projects and we have a lot of historic properties. There's a lot of steps and levels of review to make sure that our permits are, are adequately reviewed. And so we don't automatically estimate fees and issue a permit after someone's applied. So it's something we can't re remove from the system, but it is there and people just click next and go on to the final steps. The last couple of steps require including your documents. So again, I, having those prepared for you, it will tell you exactly what we need or are looking for as they're attached. Uh, the kind of caution symbols become check marks and you can see and review and, and view what you've uploaded. The last steps are to sign it. We have a disclaimer recognizing that you're telling us the truth about your project and um, any work that's needed that needs an inspection will follow the rules. Uh, you sign it, you check mark and click submit and the applicant sees a completion screen. Your application was submitted successfully and they get a companion email uh, letting them know that uh, it's been received. I'll finally uh, just note that I wanted to show a little bit more about what we see. As I said, it's a benefit to staff as well. Um, we can pull a variety of reports. We have real-time uh, submittal tracking so that we can um, you know, review and see, oh, yep, I see your permit at 123 Olmstead Road, you know, we, we know that it's come in and we can answer any questions. Uh, it's been working very well. Uh, our staff that does the intake and review has been able to communicate pretty quickly with our residents and contractors that have applied and uh, deal with any kind of technical questions pretty, pretty quickly. We also have the ability to look at reports so we can see what review stages are in place. If there's anything overdue from our reviewers, we can track that and push it along or, or check on why that might be. And then finally, this is just a look at what, um, what we see. So for each stage, there's you know an intake review, a plan review and a final issuance review. And we don't pass it along to the next step until all of those boxes are checked. I'll just note that we've had 137 entries into the online permit system so far this, um, this spring, since April 4th. And uh, that equates to about 90% of all of our permits that we've been issuing and processing in the last two months. So um, finally, the uh, this, there's a little survey at the end of your permit application to let us know how we're doing. If you have feedback on the process, then people can fill that out. And we've gotten you know, good, good feedback as well as a nice couple of com compliments. So that concludes my presentation and I'll answer any, any questions that you have. Thank you, Ashley. Is there any, yeah. any questions from anyone from the board? Ashley? Yes. About how far back does the permit information go? Um, so we have a record for the the permits. I would say the earliest I've seen is like 2010s maybe. It just depends on the property and how far back it goes. Anyone accessing the online portal and searching their property should see information as far back as we, we know. Um, so if you are curious about a property that you know, is, is yours or others, you won't be able to see the, the specific detail with the plans that are, or, and private information, but they will be able to see, you know, at this address, this offense permit was issued in 2012. And, and there may be some additional details as far as inspections too, that it passed or didn't pass. So it's a, it's a pretty good system. I've been having a lot of fun playing with it, looking <laughs> at different properties and either remembering when we did a project because the permit's there or if somebody's looking to buy a house, what the recent history's mm -hmm. been. So this mm -hmm. is terrific work. So congratulations on this. You've done a lot of streamlining since you joined us and Thank this you. is wonderful. It Thank was you. a massive project. It's still slightly underway and we're hoping to continue on a, a good trajectory. Good. So, yes. Um, if a homeowner is asked by a contractor to um, begin this application mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. I see there's a you know a space for uploading 
you know, license information by the contractor. If the homeowner doesn't have that, is there a way to put a placeholder in to alert staff to, you know, make that inquiry to the contractor? How, how does that work? So you ask a good question. There, because we've set default requirements for particular projects, there it may be re requested that there's either a that there's a contractor license supplied or a, a homeowner waiver. You know, our system will allow passage of fairly any document. So an image or a PDF document. You could always duplicate. A, a piece of information that's submitted with a note saying that you know there's there's interest in this. We always um, respond to emails as well. It, you know, certainly can email our permits desk and say, you know, I recognize that there's a license that's asked for here. Um, this type of work may not require it, but can you verify? We will always do that. Um, but if it's an issue where you can't pass a certain screen until um, you know the the waiver or something is is included, you can always duplicate an item and we'll we'll reach back out to the applicant. Okay, great. I just didn't want any residents to get stuck. Yes, we've had comments, a couple of comments about the uh, insurance information that is sometimes required. Um, but again, it's one of those steps where either the contractor is, is freely uh, offers that information or um, they can reach back to, to the village staff and we'll help work through that. Okay, great. Thanks so Thank much. You. Any, other, any other questions from trustees? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to say something? Does everything have to be done by computers? I don't know. That's a very good question. So we do still accept materials in a paper copy. We're attempting to do most of this through the computer because it cuts it cuts down on on staff time and makes sure that each piece is is set up properly. Um, it we do have a sense, especially for familiar type projects, of what's required, and we can enter things manually to process a permit just just as you need. So. Often we recommend that the contractors are the ones uh, completing the applications, um, but certainly if residents are doing the work themselves, they should still be applying for a permit and can submit a homeowner waiver with any appropriate other documentation that's required. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to pending business. <laughs> If, uh, if you all don't mind, I'd like to take a couple things out of order because I believe we have some people here that are here for item B, the discussion regarding the Berkeley Road traffic calming and business parking request. Um, um, if the village board will, will indulge me, I would like to provide an update um, on this item. Uh, and I want to thank everybody on this board and uh, staff as well as the residents in the area for um, all working together, kind of coming around and um, seeing the challenges and some of the uh, unintended consequences that 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 we're we're encouraging, we're we're coming across. Um, and I hopefully, uh, as I lay out um, this proposition for you all, you all you all uh, agree that this this will work very well. So what we would what we're thinking of is where the do not enter signs are currently located at the corner of Harlem and um, Berkeley. Those would be changed from do not enter to uh, no through traffic, local traffic only. Um, we would move the do not enter signs back to the end of the driveway of the townhomes and across from the entrance to the uh, business at, uh, on Harlem. Those do not enter signs would have a caveat on them that would say, uh, except for authorized vehicles. Authorized vehicles would obviously um, include uh, village vehicles as well as first responders and also would, uh, would include um, the residents and the visitors for the townhouses. So they would be able to uh, leave the area safely by using Berkeley or by using the alley if they wanted to head north on Harlem. As we exit um, 
the new business on Harlem, there is an exit on to Berkeley. At that point, we would put a sign that says either no left turn or right turn only. Um, so we would uh, obviously dis uh, want to dissuade them from going down Berkeley. Um, we would also be, we, we did notice that at the end of Berkeley and Bird on the corner, there is used to be an old uh, crosswalk. Um, after talking to some of the, the uh, younger residents in that area, we have decided that we were going to reinstall that crosswalk as well as a stop sign uh, to help for uh, traffic uh, coming off a of bird running into Berkeley or Berkeley running into bird because that's kind of an odd corner with bushes on the corner. We would also have signage uh, in the area that would alert um, drivers that this area is being monitored because it will be monitored because of that business. Uh, it will have video surveillance. We will have stepped up patrol by our police force in that area, especially as the new business gets running. But because of the, the type of business, we, we, we will be um, making uh, more routine stops in that area. Um, and we will also be, if you, if you look at the traffic study from 2019 or 2018 versus just the one we did a couple weeks ago, um, 2018 had about 807 uh, cars. While it says on it the enforcement rating is low, um, that's obviously done by a, a firm who doesn't live on Berkeley um, because there were nine uh, incidences where someone was going over 60 miles an hour on that stretch of the road and you know having a stretch of the road that's only a you know at best a block um, that type of speed uh, doesn't give uh, anyone any confidence that there's much control uh, or there's actually any any kind of adequate uh, time for any children or adults to 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 root um, and then as <laughs> As we go on to the June 23rd, we will notice that the, um, the amount of traffic has reduced down to 387 from 807 with not any, none, no uh, miles out, no, no speeding over 30 miles an hour. So we, we've, we've had a drastic effect in that area, uh, very positive, and it's our goal to maintain that. Um, and we, we plan on continually monitoring that, monitoring that area on a quarterly basis over the next year by installing this traffic uh, device on the flag, on the uh, light pole, and we'll be able to make sure that these um, um, signs are doing what we expect them to do and that the um, safety on Bird and Berkeley is as it is today. Um, I think I got everything. Um, is there any, any other things, I, I, anything else that I missed? Doug, you were very instrumental. Um, anything else? And I do appreciate Mr. Pollock's uh, suggestion was the, of the uh, authorized vehicles, which really was the link pin to make this whole thing work. So Doug, thank you very much for You're that. You're welcome. I, I think the cameras are important too, to warn motorists that if they cheat, it could be trouble. Um, yeah, and I assume we would have an ordinance at the next meeting. We will. Regarding yeah. all this. Correct. Yeah. Um, is there anyone from the audience that would like to speak that, are, that live on Bird in Berkeley? Ms. Grace. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Grace, da Grace Daly. I live on 521 Berkeley Road, and I have to say thank you um, for helping make sure our street is really safe, especially because um, my little brother, Jack, he loves basketball, but sometimes the ball can like roll into the street, and because we live really close to that corner where the cars can come in, the, a car can anytime tur turn in, and in fact, uh, we had a few close calls in that one situation, but also with uh, uh, last business that um, is now gonna, be, gonna become a new one, a lot of cars also came in to find parking in our area, so hopefully um, what the signs will do and the monitoring, um, 
yeah, that will make a difference. So thank you so much. Thank you, Grace. And I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me out there. Yeah. Um, you, you showed us some things that, that we weren't thinking about. Um, so I want, you know, I want you to know that every time you walk down Berkeley and you see that stop sign and that crosswalk, you know that residents of every age has a, uh, a say in this village. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Annie Harford. I live on Bird, and Gracie is my very, very best friend. I go over to her house a lot, and I have to check all three ways for cars when I'm only supposed to check two ways. Because cars shouldn't be coming in from that way, because that just makes it more dangerous for kids and I really hope that those signs and everything will help with safety because that is really important. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, if, if there is, go ahead, do, we, do you want, please. Hello, my name is Frankie, I live on Bird and I approve the um, the bump out or something like that, the signs and that. Um, but um, I think it'll definitely improve the safety. Um, even if the cars do go in, the narrower lane will probably slow them down, so it won't be as dangerous. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Um, you know, if, if this was supposed to be discussion only, um, but if we're all in agreement, um, if we want to move this forward, um, knowing that the ordinance will be come to us on the, at our June meeting or our July meeting, we can then get the signs prepared and start producing the, the stop sign and the and the uh, and the um, crosswalks and stuff. Do you so, want a consensus or do you want a motion? I would like a motion and a second. If I'll I make a motion then. I'll second. Motion by Trustee Galgo, second by Trustee Evans. Ethan, would you please call the roll? Okay. To yes. To be clear, we're okay. not proposing the bump out at this Correct. point. Correct. Yes. I, I, I apologize, I didn't read the email. Okay. Julia sent me regarding the bump out not being on the table anymore. But I just, I'd just like to know why that's not on the table anymore. The, well, the reason is, is the, unattend the unattended consequences we have with the bump out. If we put the bump out, where the KOLA specified it, which is just south, then you have a house on Berkeley and the townhouses that can no longer exit the area. They would have to, if they're gonna go north, they can't go north on Harlem, they have to cross they Harlem. Can't go north on Harlem anyway, because there's a meeting in the middle of Harlem. Right. They'd have to go over Harlem. So they'd have to go to Harlem, go south, make a U-turn to go north. Um, if we move the bump out, so we let the one neighbor on Berkeley still access Berkeley, then we've, then we've uh, made it very difficult for the townhouses to do the same thing. So that was the reason. It was the unintended consequences of the bump out. Um, so hopefully with the signage, we'll be able to get this, we'll be able to work it. We, we did notice by the traffic counts that uh, the signage that we have there is working. We don't know how that will work um, now that there's a business, because we didn't have anything with businesses. That's why we're proposing having uh, quarterly check-ins on that this signage. I like the Thank you very much. We appreciate you staying here for so long. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, any further comments? Hearing none, Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Gallagos? Aye. Trustee Mateo? Aye. Trustee Evans? Aye. Trustee Clarity? Aye. Trustee Pollock? Aye. Trustee Marshaska? Aye. Motion carries. Again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time. Um, uh, for people that went out there with me, uh, Kristen, for your, your constant... Uh, um, open dialogue with the residents. Uh, it was very helpful, and, and thank you all to the residents that were there. So we appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. There's still one other item on that particular um, request, so I just wanted to make note of it. It's re staff was supposed to give additional data to the board relative to Starbuds' request. Oh, about the parking. Okay, go ahead. We're, we're, go ahead. Sorry, if I may. 
Um, so at the last meeting, staff had uh, had discussions with Starbuds relative to allowing them to cut into the parkway um, or having the village cut into the parkway to create some additional parking. <coughs> Based on feedback from the board, the board said, well, we, we want to understand the conditions of the trees on Berkeley in that area. And so as part of that dialogue, included in the packet, Forrester Collins provided the, the conditions of those particular trees. At the same time, in tandem, myself and other staff members were talking to Starbuzz relative to their request and trying to figure out some alternatives for them to maximize parking. Um, and one suggestion was working with Dr. Normadi upon building the new parking lot and perhaps coming up with some sort of lease agreement. And so they're engaging that at the moment. Director Buckley had also suggested to them, why not wait, engage kind of what the actual needs are as did Director Tab, and they were uh, agreeable to that at this point in time. So they're asking to hold off on any further due diligence while they work through these other pieces at this point in time. Thank you. Mr. Pollock. I would just like to suggest that staff suggest to the property owner that they relook at their site plan because if they need two more parking spaces, they can do that just by designing a proper parking lot. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will move on to discussion regarding park and playground signage. Director Melchiotti. Good evening, President Ballerine, Village Trustees, Manager Francis. I can only hope to speak as eloquently as our young residents have tonight. Um, in regard to the parks and playground signage, this is an ongoing effort to redu reduce the amount of signage in our parks and playgrounds. We began this process to create signage that would not only designate park names and locations, but also assist with the enforcement of common rules. The first proposed version was presented to the board and was comprised of text. That was version one in your packet. Uh, I received direction at that meeting to revise signage to incorporate symbols or icons and reduce the overall verbiage. I would like to thank trustees Evans and Marsha Asga for their help with this project, for their insight and creativity. I worked with them to uh, design icons and reduce the verbiage in order to convey our messaging in an easier and more aesthetic manner. Uh, version two was uh, with the icons was the, the first draft that I created. And then version three is the culmination of all the feedback and direction received from trustees along with the village manager and public safety director. So just to walk you through that, this, the, this was the original, which as you can see was very wordy. Um, this was the, the second iteration, which still had some that had multiple icons, still had uh, some additional verbiage, and then the third version was the uh, reduced icons, reduced verbiage. The, another thing that I am proposing, if you notice the original version and this would be at all the parks and playgrounds. It was divided into two sections. So we had our general rules and then our playground rules. Again, in order to kind of reduce the clutter and convey our messaging in an easier and more precise manner, what I'm proposing is smaller easel type signages, signage uh, just at the playgrounds. And that would be, uh, this is not included in your packet, but it would be similar to signage at the green lot and also the commuter lot. So it would just be a smaller easel type signage right off the playground that would be specific to playground rules. That is a recommendation that I've worked with Irma with uh, upon our playground inspections. Um, they, the only other option is to have many stickers on the equipment itself um, and those don't convey all of the kind of specific playground rules. So that would be the only addition to this proposal. But if this, uh, version, that latest version with the icons is acceptable to the board, 
the next step would be to work with the sign vendor to replicate that and get a draft and if an updated quote is necessary. Trustees, any questions? Trustee Evans? So in addition to this um, sign uh, with the icons and the shortened language, you're going to post the, the two lists that we looked at originally? I'm sorry, which? The, the all text version that was shown to us originally. Are you saying you're gonna post that somewhere? No, there, well, there would be text, but it would be specific to playground rules. So it would be just this, just this side on a much smaller sign. It would still reduce the overall signage, but it would address the specific rules to playground equipment, and those would only be in the playground locations. So the rest of the, the majority of the locations would just have the icons and more aesthetically pleasing. Okay. Um, would it be okay if I looked at the text? For the playground safety yeah. as well? Sure. Please, thank you. Of the, there's two icon-based images or two icon-based signs in our materials. Mm -hmm. Those are for different purposes. One is for the park and one is for the playground or that those are different versions? Different versions. Uh, the only reason I included that version two and that you could tell by they had multiple icons for a couple of the rules, I just wanted to include that so you saw kind of the the iterations, the, you know, kind of the progress of the project. So version, the second one in our materials is the winner? No, they're, that the third blocked. version with the reduced number of icons. Most of the icons have a single image and it's reduced. The verbiage is reduced even more. This is the one, okay. Yes. This is a low value add comment, but I proofread for a living. The first one, park hours from dawn to dusk, doesn't have a period at the end of it and all the other ones do, and I'm gonna leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll follow up on that. How about adopting the verbiage from version two for version three saying simply finds assessed for property damage? I don't think we need to say it's coming from the village because it's village property. I'm, I'm fine with either iteration that's open for discussion. Those were just, that was the feedback received uh, during the process. So that was, that's what we went with. Like I said, the original, that version two, um, any combination of that verbiage could be used. Are you good with the worded the wordage on that uh, the half of uh, item one? Oh, I thought that was the original. Is is the new sign with the all, the list of text in the materials? No. You're planning on you the sign number one. You have the right side of it, which is the playground rules. Mm -hmm. Are you still going to use those? Yes, that would be the smaller easel sign just at the playgrounds. And that's what you wanted to... The general rules on the left-hand side, that is what has been replaced with reduced verbiage and icons. So this will go at every park and playground location, and then only the smaller easel signs would go at the playgrounds, specifically detailing playground rules. Um, yeah, we so we did talk to that. I, it would be all right if I just go through and edit it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And conceptually, are we all on the same page here? Preferred to be. Okay. I think it represents a great improvement over the uh, first iteration that we were, received a few months ago, and I think it'll be far more universally understandable, and I really appreciate the effort that's gone into this. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Ron. Yes, me too. It was actually a fun project to work on together. I appreciate your insight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move on to uh, new business. Uh, first is an ordinance amending Title 8, Section 862, Water Service Charge, and an ordinance amending Section 879, Sewer Service Charge of the Village of Riverside, Illinois. Director Johns. Good evening. Before you tonight is an ordinance amending 
the water and sewer charges for the village of Riverside. We recently received a notice from the village of McCook of who we purchased our water from that they would be raising our water rates by 4.73% effective June 1st. The ordinance in front of you increases the sewer rate by 4.73% from $3.77 per unit to $3.95 per unit. This also increases the current water rate by that 4.73% passed on from McCook, as well as $1.21 per 100 cubic foot unit um, to start funding the lead service line replacement um, discussed at a previous meeting. This will increase the rate from $12.73 per unit to $14.54 per unit. These are the 100 cubic feet units, also in the units or in the ordinance is those costs in 1,000 gallon increments as we transition to um, the new meters. Okay, so um, as I look at this, the annual increase for minimum bill is $59.71 and for the average bill is 131.37 Correct. annually. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, hearing none, if I can have a motion in a second. Motion by Trustee Mateo, second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Galgos. Any further comments? <coughs> Hearing none. Mr. Soule. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Motion carries. We move on to B, a resolution amending the Village of Riverside Employee Manual, Section 3.05, 3.06, and 3.12 relative to paid time off. Director Johns. Good evening. Um, before you tonight is a resolution amending the personnel policy manual, removing the waiting time for new employees to utilize their sick and vacation time. Previously, there was a six month waiting period for people to use their sick time benefits and a 12 month period to use their vacation benefits. If any employee left during that first year, we would have still been liable to pay out those vacation benefits. Um, it also makes a change so that staff accrues um, time off benefits on a biweekly basis instead of a monthly basis. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. I'll move. Motion by Trustee Gallego, second. Second. Second by Trustee Marshaska. Any further comments? Hearing none, Ethan. Trustee Galagos? Aye. Trustee Mateo? Aye. Trustee Evans? Aye. Trustee Clarity? Aye. Trustee Pollock? Aye. Trustee Marshaska? Aye. Move on to letter C, discussion on sustainability and building incentive program policy proposal. Ms. Monroe. Thank you. Last fall, the village board had a discussion during our budget process about uh, opportunities to create a program or policy that would enhance our, our building permitting, but also achieve some sustainability objectives. And at that time, the direction was for staff to consider a program or, or you know, project that would direct focus on addressing stormwater issues. And so we did some research and came back with a proposed program that would uh, set aside a total of up to $5,000 for an instant permit rebate of up to $250. There are specific criteria and a threshold that would need to be met in order to be considered for the instant rebate. It would be considered during a standard building permit process. So they would have to go through a, a regular building permit process and would need to meet two or more objectives, including drainage or standing water directly is causing damage to structures or homes. Uh, there would need to be some type of documented evidence of standing water for over 24 hours after a rainfall. The proposed project has the potential to significantly improve an identified drainage issue or the proposed project will aid in complying with village regulations and provide benefits to multiple properties. 
Um, they would need to meet two of those objectives in order to be considered. And a lot of our projects that would fall into this realm, uh, some of them are complex, can be very expensive to redo uh, various drain tiles or other drainage projects. And some projects are very simple. They can be done by residents in a weekend um, at their own cost. But this provides a little bit of assistance for the different types of those projects. A rebate of up to $250 could help with uh, coverage of one of our engineering reviews that may be required um, or otherwise prevent people from having any interest in pursuing a project like this. So it could be a rain garden, a drywall installation, gutter disconnection, or other projects that address some pump drainage type issues. So those were the things that we identified as a, as a possibility. And based on our permit history and the opportunity to use the grant, we're thinking about, not grant, um, the funding, if approved, um, would cover about 20 projects at, at minimum. Uh, it could be more if people are taking advantage but don't necessarily require that full 250. I'll take any questions if you have them. Pollock. Thank you. A um, couple questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First, um, am I understanding this correct that if you install a rain barrel, you're supposed to get a permit? We don't currently require it. Uh, I would say if there's cost to the resident that would you know, in, encourage some elevated use of a rain barrel. So if they need, if they're going to install this and then also attach or reconfigure their gutters or something like that, that would require either a contractor or more significant work, then this would apply. Um, currently, we don't require permit for a rain barrel installation. We encourage it, um, and there's various ways of connecting and, and connecting your, your downspouts to those um, that don't necessarily require a full-scale revamp. But so you're saying currently we don't require a permit for a mm -hmm. rain barrel. Does that mean we will after this? We're just encouraging people to document the installation if they would like an inspection or other things that would um, make sure that that improvement is installed properly. So they would go through that process. If they're, if they're doing it on their own, we wouldn't require it, just would encourage it. And, they, and then we wouldn't be providing a, a rebate. A, a side note for future consideration, and this has come up before, and it's not really related to the matter at hand, but uh, the board has talked about uh, doing, you know, kind of digging into our requirements for permits and changing the threshold when a permit's required, mm -hmm. when it's not. And I'd still like to do that sometime soon. I suppose we're already well into the construction season, so maybe the goal is to do it before next construction season. Um, that That's just a side note. Um, the, the other question I had on this was, were we going to do something similar for permeable pavers? So we, I'm starting with this type of project. Um, it is a program or our model that we could extend and expand into permeable paver uh, projects. We have just that the general idea concept in this that it's not something that we would reward if you are already required to meet certain standards. So if someone were to be required as part of their voluntary building permit um, to add additional stormwater management things, this would not qualify. This is a proactive reward, essentially, for doing things that are beyond the expectation of their projects. And so we could do that with the permeable surfaces. I know that Planning and Zoning Commission is tackling through their work plan a review of how we're calculating impervious and pervious surfaces. And so I think it's best to start with this and then move into that when we have a solid way of calculating that, that area. Thank you. Great. I, I think permeable pavers are something we need to look at. I mean, it's, Absolutely. I mean, it, people are, have their choice when they're doing a driveway of doing cement or doing mm -hmm. pavers. Yeah. Um, and there are, there is a difference between pavers and permeable pavers. Correct. Um, so I, I think we need to, um, to encourage that in this process. Um, with along the gutter disconnect and the rain barrels, 
Um, you know, I'd also like to, 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 I know there's some other villages that actually have an ordinance that says you need to get your gutters out of the sewer system. Mm -hmm. That is something else we need to start looking at. Yep. Um, uh, but with, with um, when it comes to the, the rain barrels and your installation, that could be an easy, um, something on our, on our website. Here's where you can go to get rain barrels. Metropolitan Water Reclamation District always has sales or other things. I know Trustee Mateo has a ingenious mm -hmm. system on her gutters <laughs> that um, diverts the product. So stuff like that, yeah. that if we had on our website, people would be able to, uh, to do a lot of this themselves. And, and I know I've seen, where can I get a rain barrel? Um, yes. So, I mean, I think we need to, to work our website too with this too. Absolutely. With the promotion and, and any materials, if, if this is uh, approved to go forward and implemented, we will absolutely kind of look comprehensively at our materials through rain garden installation to the rain barrels and other techniques that people can use to actively manage it, even if they don't feel it's, it's rising to the level of a permit. They, anytime people are grading, this would also help them with, with that. Any other questions? Yes, so PZC is also going to propose incentives regarding pervious surfaces. So that will be a nice program to potentially mm -hmm. develop after that. They're also discussing the downspout separation as Great. part of this work plan project. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about the program criteria. So mm -hmm. top of page 202 mm -hmm. in the PDF. The last two, that it has potential to significantly improve the issue and it will aid in complying with village regulations and benefit multiple properties, including the villages. You've done this research, and this is a really mm -hmm. exciting project. Um, why not require those two? We, we certainly can, can do so. Uh, it's just saying that it would be two of, of the four as a minimum. I didn't want to leave it as, as a minimum, but we certainly could include both of those two is a requirement, and then add the other others as a proposed option. I'm, I'm definitely open to it. Well, you did your research. I just wondered yeah. if others might have or trustee opinions. Are we going to are, are we going to um, dovetail this with the work that PZC is doing so we can roll this out all together so we have the pavers and and on the downspouts and everything together. It just seems like it's all one project. Um, they, they could address, they address similar issues, the same issues potentially. Um, this was an easy start to things that people are, are actively pursuing as our permeable surfaces. Um, this was just an effort to start with a couple of projects types to get it started. And then as we de further develop it, we can, again, promote the program next year and introduce new opportunities for people to capture it that may not have taken advantage or if there's a different type of consideration as, as an expansion of a program saying, well, you did this type and then this will even Take add to your, your lots preservation. Okay, thank you. I think this is a great start. So in the criteria, documented mm -hmm. evidence of standing water is one of the potential criteria. Mm -hmm. In the application, I think I missed it, do they need to include proof of flooding issues? We, if, they're, if their contention is that they are uh, doing this for purposes of managing that standing water, we, it's very simple to provide something like a time-stamped photo with an, with an address. Um, so something like that either, or a request for us to visit, you know, we have building inspections most days or staff can stop by and, and observe the conditions based on when the water came we before. So rain. yeah, I, I think that's to be determined. Uh, I think from a practical standpoint, just providing some type of proof with the timestamp would be sufficient. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, um, it, Providing incentives like this to residents to address uh, the water issues, you know, on their property is really important. I think it's a wonderful first step. I don't think it's critical um, that the all of the criteria are satisfied. Um, you know, with the um, the one that concerns me is the benefits to multiple properties item. 
Uh, I don't think that every project can um, necessarily satisfy that. And I don't think that those that don't, but also hit others, should be penalized, you know, with yeah, a program one like this. Gave me yeah. some concern, mm -hmm. too. So, um, <clears throat> and I'll also, I think uh, it's good to get a test case like this underway uh, while planning and zoning is working through uh, the more complex issues related to uh, permeable pavers, additions, and driveway projects and the like. So I, I think we go with a low-hanging fruit for starters and uh, see where it gets us. And um, I'm really excited about the work that PNZ is undertaking here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So then. We're, we're well, yes. Please okay, move wonderful. Forward. I will prepare uh, further information. The draft of the application in your packet will be similar, and then we'll do some promotion of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a question, ma'am? Okay, that's 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 a different. If you want to bring that up, you could bring that up under uh, residents' requests at another time. This has this this. We need to keep this meeting moving. We not yet, but thank you. Um, we will move on to a resolution endorsing the Chicago Metropolitan Mayor Caucus Green Region Compact. Assistant Manager Monroe. Thank you. Okay, so the Greenest Region Compact has been in effect with the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus since 2007. Okay, so uh, the Greenest Region Compact has been uh, a resolution voluntary by over 150 municipalities in the Chicagoland region that has uh, come into effect over the last decade and a half. And uh, in light of the village's participation in the C4, so the Cross Community Climate Collaborative, and other efforts that we've made over the last decade and plus uh, certainly qualifies the village of Riverside as, as a community that cares about the environment and, and the actions that we can take to improve that. The mayor's compact is, uh, like I said, just a very simple resolution that allows us to work as a team with all the municipalities and agencies that have signed on to this. and. Uh, shows support for the efforts being made by the mayor's caucus. So um, just for your consideration, and uh, I'll take any questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. I'll make the motion. Motion by Trustee Gallego, second. Second. Second by Trustee Marsazga. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, Ethan, if you'd please. Trustee Gallagher? Aye. Trustee Mateo? Aye. Trustee Evans? Aye. Trustee Clarity? Aye. Trustee Pollock? Aye. Trustee Marshawska? Aye. <clears throat> Move on to letter E, a resolution revising the policy for village sponsorship or the sponsorship of special events. Clerk Soule. Good evening. Uh, staff would just like to update the special event policy uh, so that we can require applicants to provide a security plan. Uh, a lot of times this happens already. This is part of the process, especially for our larger and multi-day events. Uh, usually it's done in tandem with Public Safety Director Buckley, uh, Public Works Director Tab, and myself. We usually meet out and see what the plan is for the event. This is just putting it into our policy and requiring it uh, if we need to uh, in the event. So there are other updates in this policy as suggested by Village Council, um, but other than that, that's all we have. Mr. Buckley, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, just I think it's a very important part of this process, it's imperative that every event that we host or have here in the Village of Riverside is done safely and securely. Uh, this will help us to get a little piece of the planning process. Um, we avail ourselves 24-7 to assist with this. We're always there to uh, make sure that any event that's going to take place in the Village 
uh, that we have a, our hand in developing that policy or the safety plans uh, for that event. Uh, and so we look forward to working with everybody to get that done. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. So motion made by Trustee Mateo, second. Second. Second by Trustee Evans. Any other comments? Hearing none, Ethan. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Motion carries. We move on to an ordinance authorizing renewal of the aggregation program for electrical load. Clerk Saul. Good evening again. So the village has utilized uh, an opt-out aggregation program for both residents and small business rate payers since 2012. An aggregation program, uh, what it does is it aggregates the electrical load of our ratepayers and residents, um, only those that haven't selected their own supplier, and then negotiates a rate for them. Uh, the ver village's current agreement is with MC Squared Energy Services, which expires in October of 2023. Since the implementation process takes multiple months, uh, we recently uh, implemented a request for a proposal process and obtained bids to renew this program. It is worth noting that over the course of the recent agreement with MC Squared, which ranged from 2020 to 2023, the village offset over 130 million kilowatt hours of power in 36 months with renewable energy from wind generation facilities. The village also currently ranks number three on the EPA Green Power Communities list for green power percentage consumed. The village's aggregation consultant, Sharon Durling, is here with us tonight, and she'll provide an overview of the bids we received and advise for further action. Um, I think you have bid res sheet results that were received this afternoon. Um, we've worked with 12 elect suppliers in uh, Illinois electric aggregation programs, every supplier that's ever done a program, but um, the suppliers are dwindling. There are fewer bidders, and we have bids from Dynegy Energy, Energy Harbor, and MC Squared Energy Services. Um, if I can back up, I just want to say I was a speaker last week in Peoria at the Illinois City Managers Association on sustainability issues because I was coming here tonight and had just reviewed your data. Um, I was talking about sustainability. There were a lot of big, you know, large cities there, but I mentioned Village of Riverside, you know, smallish village can make a huge impact. And when I stated that cumulatively over the last three years, you have retired renewable energy credits to offset greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to 51 million tons of coal burning. Um, people, you could hear a little bit of surprise. I mean, that is meaningful. And I just thought that was, an, so I gave a little shout out for Village of Riverside for that. Also, it's interesting that the um, resolution you just passed, the Mayor's Greenest Region Compact, your electric aggregation program achieves one of those objectives, so you're already on the way with that um, Greenest Region Compact. So back to the bids, um, Ukraine war and gas prices really churned electric markets, um, so that's been a big disruption for us. But your program continued because you had a three-year contract, so you, you know, went smoothly through that difficult time. Um, the offers are less than you currently have, and there's only one offer um, for the ComEd price match program, one supplier that offers, and it's significantly less, I'll tell you why, capacity prices in our grid have collapsed significantly. It's done the opposite in Ameren, downstate Illinois, but we're not in downstate Illinois. So um, rather than 100% renewable energy, the supplier MC Squared Energy Services, which currently serves your community, um, is offering just minimal amount to achieve EPA certification. So you could still retire close to 1,000 tons of you know, burning coal offsets per year, but that's um, option one, if you can see on the sheet. Option two, we always ask for fixed rate prices and none of the pricing would offer any guarantees for savings for your residents. So because the ComEd base rate annualized is about 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour for the next 12 months, um, you can see none of these bids are below that number. So might be advisable not to um, set up a program where residents are paying a premium. But you can continue with your fixed rate program and still achieve 
uh, EPA Green Partner Power Shop partnership, which would keep you in the top 100 in the USA. There are not a lot of communities that do this, you know, village-wide where every resident, whether they're enrolled or not, would have some of their um, electricity offset by renewable energy credits. That was a lot. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Any questions from anyone? to see the percentage of um, renewable energy credits decrease from 100% to 5%. Yes, it's huge. That's drastic. Mm -hmm. um, did we look into um, community solar? Uh, I know that there are certain facilities that are going to be built. I, I just don't understand, uh, because they haven't been built yet, what the timing is and how a gap might work with our current contract. Interesting that you brought that up, Trustee Marshall. Um, I, this is, you're the first community that I'm gonna state this to. We're actually talking about doing community solar with municipal aggregation. We're just approaching the Illinois Power Agency about doing that. It might be one or two years out. It would be a brand new thing. So. That would be a really interesting opportunity because it would also ensure uh, a savings of 10%, not huge, but 10% of the supply portion of your ComEd bill. Um, so that would be greening and saving. You're the first trustee in the world that's ever asked me that question. Um, community solar can be offered, but right now as it goes, individual residents have to opt into that and um, there's wait lists so it's not, um, it wouldn't bring any um, profound greening or sustainability to the community, but it's certainly an option for residents to do. It's something that we're approaching for maybe you know two years from now to do as an aggregation program, which would be fabulous if we can get that to happen. Uh, what is the timing for us to decide on this proposal here today? Um, today would be your last date because it's 70 to 90 days to implement a program. And um, actually the last day in September, you have an October maturity date and the first meters for October actually right end of September. Now, if I understand correctly, we agree to this. Everyone in Riverside gets on to gets this gets this rate and the resident has the option to opt out all residents may opt out with the comed price match program some residents receive an opt out notice others remain at comed and that gets into some complications of how it works but all residents are treated equally all residents pay exactly the comed rate whether they enroll with mc squared or stay with comed but if they're already with, if they opted out already and they're with ComEd, they do not have to do anything to stay with ComEd. That's correct. Okay. So it, the other option, by the way, is to suspend the program. You could just end it. So, um, you know, the the highest value would be to continue at that really low, and I'll say it's disappointing, down, down to 5% green. That's all we have right now because of collapse in capacity prices. In fact, other communities, I think Hanover Park, I don't, not, don't think I know, Hanover Park just renewed at that rate, 5%, Lake Barrington, 5% drop from 100 to five. It's not ideal. We hope things in the market change changes in two years. So again, you could suspend the program in, and then all residents that are involved would receive a notice saying, we're moving you all back to ComEd, the program's over. And you probably get some solicitors, but that's what it is. Or continue with this lower rate and still achieve the APA, EPA uh, partnership. Can a resident choose um, one of the 100% renewable on a one-off basis? Do they have that option? They do not. It would be a much higher rate. So um, if a resident wanted 100%, I would recommend they go to the Illinois Power Agency website and find an offer. It's probably, rather than the ComEd 6.9 cents, might be 9, 10, 11 cents per kilowatt hour. But it's an absolute option. Someone wants that would encourage them to go. It's a bit of a premium, but they might want to do that. Thank you. I want to make sure we have all the options. All the options. There is a low-income solar program for individual residents um, that we could put up on the website. Um, so that's 
funded through the state. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The Illinois Solar for All. Okay, so we have a, the question is whether we want to go 12, 24 months um, with MC Energy on the price match or whether we want to um, move on and wait. Well, I have been alerted to a number of facilities that are going to be built for community solar, and I think it would be worth looking into, um, you know, whether we can buy in and what the timetable would be for that. I think the facilities are not going to be built uh, probably for another, you know, 10 months to a year, uh, but they want subscriptions in advance. So I don't know how that works timing wise with locking into a contract like this any resident can sign up for community solar and we do offer those programs it's not an aggregation program typically you know two to three percent of residents will sign up for something like that and there's a wait period right now the pro the only programs i know you can sign up for you have to be very low income it's for that 50 percent saving um, and you have to put, you know, like on a snap card or something like that. But for um, individuals, it's just not available right now, but that's something, it's different from aggregation. Aggregation is the program wherein all residents are enrolled unless they choose to opt out or they're invited to enroll. Um, community solar, anyone can leave an aggregation program at any time. 10 months from now, if there's an available community solar project, Anyone could leave, never a early termination fee. And we would encourage to, for every resident to make whatever choice they like, whether a premium now for 100% green or 10 months or two years from now for community solar. Lots of options. But today before us is, you know, do you want to continue your aggregation or suspend? Any thoughts? I mean, I would, I would think that we had price match and if we're in a a lull here with this that would be don't correct me if I'm wrong it would be best for us to do the shortest period we can because things will change well I don't think I do have a little bit of a crystal ball uh, president Mallory um, the capacity prices aren't going to improve for a couple of years if we were to be able to present community solar for, as an aggregation program, that's a much longer runway. Um, that's a lot of developers that would ha that would take several years out to get started, and the IPA hasn't even approved it. We're at the pre-embryonic stages of that. It's an exciting idea, and no one's heard it publicly before. So that's um, it's a long runway. So I would say 24 months is would be then you you know, lock it up, I don't think you're gonna see any advantages between now and two years from now. Okay. It's just my commentary. But. Okay. Thank you. With that, do I have a motion for, to move forward on this or just, would we walk away? Yeah, just to clarify that the 24 months is kind of what Sharon and I had been talking about, 12 or 24, leaning towards 24. The, the doing that would guarantee us at least some percentage of green power, we'd stay on the EPA list probably in the top 100 is what Sharon was kind of saying, we'd stay on, we wouldn't be number three anymore. But uh, the alternative of not doing the aggregation program is that we would just have traditional brown power. So it wouldn't be green at all. Thank you. That further explanation, do we have a motion? Do we have a thought? So we're choosing between zero, five, 25 and 100 percent. No, we're, well, we're, we can we can do that, but we're we're right now we're choosing between 12 months or 24 months matching Commonwealth Edison. Um, if we don't, if we're not worried about matching Commonwealth Edison, we can go to those other programs on below. Correct? Yes, and residents would pay a premium to the comment rate for that, which you could choose. So that is an option. Which in your packet in 20, I think it was 2017, uh, the village board did decide to take a premium at one point uh, to guarantee that green power. Um, that was when you were either choosing green power or not, and green power was more expensive. Um, so it was decided at one point, but you don't have to. So comment power at 6.9 with 
full twenty full hundred percent green at seven point nine. What does that mean for the average resident? You, you said ComEd rate is 6.973. At what? There, there's well, zero. It says ComEd base rate is 6.973. Yes. Let's Correct. say we went with Dynergy Energy for 24 months or 12 months, it's 7.5. So, what does that mean for their average residents for their bill? Um, I should get my calculator, but let, let me do that real quick to get okay. a real number for you. And let me also say that that ComEd base rate does not include a monthly variable that could increase or decrease it by a half cent per kilowatt hour. So technically, the ComEd, the ComEd rate does vary every month. It's within a specific range, so it could go as low as 6.4 cents per kilowatt hour or as high as 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour. The ComEd rate is always varied, but it's always within a specific range. So, you know, you could get into a little danger rope danger area if it's 6.4 cents and you're at 7 point we'll go 6 cents um, excuse me for a minute my math is uh, yeah it would be um, the average households typically 9,000 kilowatt per hour probably a little less than that. You'd be, you could um, risk overage of maybe $120 or so per resident for the course of a year, $10 a month, just would be the worst risk. So a $10, a $10 uh, premium to go all green. Yes. At the 12 month uh, 7.571, correct? Um, I'm at the 7.61. I was looking at the Dynergy. Where, oh, the 7.571. That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. So now you know. It's $10 a month if we want to go 100%. And, if you, and residents do have the option to, to walk away from it. Opt out. Opt out. They do have the option to walk out. So, yes, Doug. I didn't plan to go with the 100% for 24 months. 24, uh, 12 months or 24 months? I could go either way there. I suppose the more conservative would be 12 months. Okay. So we have a 12 months on the table at 100% green. Are you going to, can you make that motion? You make that motion? Sure. I'll make a motion that we go with the uh, 12 months uh, Dynagy Energy uh, aggregation. Uh, at 100% green energy um, at a base base price of 7.571 per kilowatt hour. Okay, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Marshaska. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I don't, we put you on the spot doing math. I just want to be <laughs> sure that you're confident. Sure, I'll do number. that again. Sure. Right? I, because I what just, I don't want to happen is a decimal got lost and it's $100 a month for residents and they don't, <laughs> we didn't do a great job communicating it and all of a sudden we have a kerfuffle on our hands. Very so, good. Thank you. I, I, twice I did it three times, times, but let me do it a fourth time. 6.4 would be the lowest. It'd be likely to, could go. Um, that's like measure twice, cut once. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm, I'm having trouble now that I'm on the spot here. <laughs> you can help me with the math. Um, typically, 9,000 kilowatt hours in, uh, let's say, one and a half cents. So I, I, I've got like between $110, $135 a year. Okay, so it's still in the $10 price. $10 a month. And your it, motion is predicated on that math being roughly okay. correct. Sure. Okay. And it should be still known that if a resident does not want this, they can opt out. They may opt out. That is okay. correct. Okay. Thank you. At have, any time. At any time. We have a motion and a second. I have a comment. Yes. So what happens after a year? Will there be a different... Um, She'll come back. Something you different? Could seek, we might you not could have such new, a good deal. You could seek new bids. Um, the comment rate will be different. The market will be different because it's a commodity. This price is only held for 24 hours, so we'd have to move quickly on getting that contract signed tomorrow. But the, um, yeah, everything changes. So next year we don't know what we would see. 
And your crystal ball isn't telling you anything. Your crystal ball isn't telling you what to expect no, in year because, two? No, um, because uh, the stock market went up today, and I couldn't have guessed if it was going to go up or down. And electricity is a commodity. I couldn't have guessed the um, COVID would, I'm just going to say, reduce stores significantly at the same time as sort of the um, perfect storm, Ukraine war started. And that really threw things into disarray, pricing-wise, just out of the gas station. So that's nothing we could guess. So I don't have a crystal ball for uh, pandemics or wars. Okay. And that affects us here in Riverside. Okay. Any further questions? We have a motion and a second. Just to clarify, we're on 12 months, 100% green? Yes. Okay. With Dianagy. 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 correct. Yes. I know that Sharon was kind enough to calculate the, on average, how much an additionally the, a resident would be paying. Obviously, if they have higher volume in their utilization, so I did the percentage, it is approximately 18% of a premium based on the kilowatt hour in the differential. So just so that, and you have to remember that you have the commodity amount, which is the electric, but then the delivery, which is ComEd, because you're utilizing their infrastructure. So I just wanted the board to be aware of that number as well. Thank you. Your percentages are the same as mine. I appreciate your yep. pointing that out as well. Okay. You still good? Um, yes. Can anybody consider two years? I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, I, I did but think about 24 higher. months as well, but. Yeah, it's gonna be more expensive. Well, it wouldn't stay the same for two years. Mm -hmm. no, it would, but it's more expensive than. than uh, it would be, uh, okay. it would be nearly uh, eight cents, so 7.97 starting from day one through the end of the day. Uh, we've seen electric rates drop some years. Usually people say, oh, you know, power rates are always going up. They don't always, there are a lot of things that come into play. A lot of volatility. I also think we're seeing some interesting developments in um, like carbon markets and um, solar developments that are happening um, in other areas off site. Um, so I think the next year will be really interesting to see what happens with energy prices and the renewable energy credits markets. Um, so I think maybe one year is probably a, a good test case. Okay. Ethan? Yeah, yes. Sorry. No problem. What can um, what do we do to communicate to our residents about the program and their ability to opt out? They will get a letter from Dynagy Energy, Dynagy. with it, which would actually be on the village's letterhead, village's local. But um, you have you can you get to approve what the letter says. And can we push this through our e-blast and our, our very active and fantastic social media? Yes, we, like we've done in previous years, we will do all of that to make sure, we will do it to the best of our ability. Obviously we're limited to if, if people don't read it, um, but then we also provide a number that they can call, they'll also call here, so staff will be up to speed to answer any questions and Sharon and her team are amazing at also answering those different questions as well. And a resident can choose to opt out at any time. At any time. Three months in, nine months in, 10 months in. At Correct. any time and never for any fee, that's the law. Okay, I just wanna be sensitive. I think it's a great program. I think a lot of our residents are um, green energy minded and so I'd like to be able to provide this to them but 18% is a lot so I wanna make sure that we're adequately communicating to some of our more economically sensitive residents that they have the opportunity to opt out. Um, if I may make a further comment on the 18%, thanks for saying that's 18% of the supply portion of your bill which for some people might be even less than half of bills, half of their bills so it wouldn't be that's helpful. 18% of the entire bill, so it's a smaller portion. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just make one comment, certainly not second guessing. I think the conversation's great. On the plug in Illinois site in the ComEd territory, it might be one of the highest rates you've, you will see. However, all of my communities have had 100% green energy. None have been able to achieve that recently. There's one community that got a little bit of a premium for a smaller amount of green energy, so you would be the Village of Riverside, to my information, I think I know everybody out there, would be the only 100% community, and it would be probably the highest rate, but again, it's not um, a screaming high rate. 
something that you choose. Director Johns um, wanted me to make the board aware that by us opting into this program, the village, we have utility accounts as well. And so it would be an approximate increase of 5,000 for what we, what we pay on an annual basis. So just so the board is aware. And the board can decide to opt out of that. <laughs> At any time. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Just, just so want to throw that out there. Certainly. I just, that, that, we would. it wasn't something that we necessarily budgeted or anticipated. And so also want to make the board aware of that as well. Okay. But that's only for small commercial accounts under 15,000 kilowatt hours per year. So I don't know that that would apply. Okay. So you're all set. No need to opt out. All right. Thank you. Ethan, hurry up. Want me to call the roll? Please call the roll. <laughs> Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Motion carries. Um, I know we only have two more things left, but I'd like to move to. Valerie, before we move on, I'm sorry. So we, we had a motion that indicates our the direction we want to go on the green energy. There was on the agenda a resolution authorizing you, uh, re first off, reaffirming our uh, commitment, to the commitment to the aggregation program, and then authorizing you to execute a contract to that effect. Are we uh, intending to uh, pass that tonight, or are we deferring that to a future meeting? We have to we sign the contract tomorrow, if I understood correctly. Yeah, so then we, yeah. we would need to uh, uh, approve that uh, ordinance, uh, which is, uh, have it as page 222 of my packet. This simply grants you the authority to sign the contract. I would make that motion to approve the ordinance authorizing renewal of the aggregation program for electrical load. Second. We have a motion by Trustee Pollock and a second by, was it Kristen? No. Or Jill. Jill? I'm sorry. Uh, second by Ms. Ms. Mateo. Any further comments? Hearing none, Ethan. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, if you don't mind, I think we're going to move on to H just um, because I think this is going to be a discussion and I see Bill, Billy's falling asleep in the back row back there. Um, so, so we have a discussion of economic development assistant application for R Marts 3346 South Harlem Avenue. Assistant Village Manager Monroe. All right, thank you. Um, so the village village staff was approached by Mr. McCluskey asking about the the program for economic development assistance um, as it applies to Business District Two. Um, they have a property at uh, 3346 South Harlem Avenue. So uh, the Armart stop. And uh, they are an eligible property within the business district. Uh, the program offers a variety of supports for uh, funding various uh, economic development tools, including uh, exterior biz building improvements and, and other uh, aspects. The fund availability is currently an, a negative fund balance. Um, the village had pur purchased property and uh, drove that a little bit further into the negative column. Um, we do receive some revenues uh, year to year, but it remains negative. That being said, um, they did sit down with me for a short meeting uh, to discuss the project and their proposal, their interest in improvements made to the property and still wanted to see if there was any interest from the village board in supporting any part of the project. And so Mr. McCloskey is here and he can answer any questions uh, related to the project or if you have questions for staff, I can, I can cover that as well. Thank you. Bill? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm very, I've been a 35 year resident here at Riverside. All my kids went through Riverside schools. It's a great community and we're really proud to serve in Riverside. I've met with you, uh, some of you on several occasions. Um, business is tough right now uh, in the convenience store industry. Uh, commuter traffic has not rebounded. Uh, people are still working from home. This has a, a very negative uh, impact on our business. Uh, in addition, we don't own the property, we rent the property, so we have to pay a landlord. 
and our real estate, and the real estate taxes, which are anticipated to grow up to ninety thousand dollars for next year. So uh, that's a big burden. So we we really know we need to modernize, um, and we 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 want to modern, modernize, and we are looking under every manhole and everything for, for revenue. So, you know, anything, we've been a really good neighbor, I believe, um, for the last 35 years. Um, we have donated, you know, just donated a, a, a large amount of concessions to the Junior Bulldogs basketball tournament. We're constantly donating product and time and all that. Our staff is all, primarily all live in Riverside and um, our, we really believe that, um, and we're very proud of that. So any, any assistance um, we can get would be greatly appreciated. As far as the actual remodel goes, it's, uh, I think you have it in your packet. Um, we, we just need to modernize. We, we went through a, that terrible storm last June, um, and we're tying in a new um, branding image. We're, actually converting it from Minuteman to Armarts. And Armarts is a fam third generation family owned business. Um, they're very committed. We have 12 stores and we are very proud to say that we know the names of each and every employee, 100 employees that work for us. So um, we hope that this will stimulate some more sales uh, the Costco, which is located in North Riverside, has really impacted our, our, our volume, and it's also impacted Riverside's tax revenues mm -hmm. as well. Um, I believe there's a, a penny gas tax plus a sales tax that's leaving Riverside and going somewhere else. So we're really trying to stimulate and make the place modern and up-to-date and be more competitive in the market. So. Any questions? Trustees? I do have a question. It's more for staff. So the EDC used to have a facade improvement program. Were all of those funds exhausted? I'm sorry? EDC has a facade improvement program. Are all those funds exhausted? I will turn that one over to Director Johns. They are not, but that facade improvement um, program is limited to the Central Business District. Is there a timeline for this project? <laughs> we need to know how much money we can get. Yes, we are, we're ready to go. Um, we started uh, this Armard branding in two of our other locations. And as soon as we can determine our budget, we're ready to pull the trigger and, and get this done. Um, what is the, the total of the exterior facade improvements? Um, you got that answer. 10, okay. uh, 27. Yeah, so the exterior improvements totals uh, $112,363. Um, we divided them but also in your pocket between a quote to do the demo of a partial of the canopy as well as some reconstruction for $30,000 and then the great majority of the exterior painting along with uh, the canopy, uh, you know, decorative elements and, and other reconstruction is for 82,363. And then they list some interior improvements planned for the, for the shop as well. Um, if the board, if the board decided to help fund the exterior portions of this, uh, where would the funds come from? Well, right now the business district two um, is currently running at a deficit. And so if we were to fund any portion of this, that would just increase that deficit. However, once we sell property located in business district two, then it would no longer be at a negative. So part of it is timing. So it's really shifting of funds. So essentially there would be a loan from the general yeah. fund unassigned fund balance for this that then would be paid back through revenue that's generated through the business district. 
Yeah, I, I think because of this, the location, it's, it's very important for us to, to try to help modernize this, this uh, facade. And, and I would probably venture say our marts is probably one of the biggest contributors to the business district. Uh, I would say over the last 30 years, we're probably the second highest sales tax contributor in Riverside. Um, so, I mean, just the thought process. 10% of the exterior, not to exceed 12,193. I would be very comfortable with that. I, I'd be happy to support that. I think um, I appreciate the longevity in the community. We have a lot of businesses that we're proud of in the community, but this is a business that has been here for a very long time and is committed to Riverside. I've met a lot of your staff. They live in Riverside. Um, we should all be buying our gas in Riverside. Thank you. Right? Thank you, Megan. Costco, right? yes. we, I think we need to make an effort here. Um, and I think it's consistent with our goals to improve facade and improve yeah. things on Harlem. You know, we are, you know, the main thoroughfare to go into downtown Riverside, and we would be willing to, you know, use some of the property for some informational signage for the village as well. So that's something to think about. And you currently, you guys use the cameras, right? We, we provide our building for traffic cameras and all that. Okay. So does that sound like a, okay. If I can have a motion and a second. I'll motion. Oh, second. Motion by Trustee Clarity, second by Trustee Gallagos. Any further comments? I just have one comment for you. I did notice in several of your specs here, you're specking out Benjamin Moore paint. I do want to remind you that at the other side of the railroad tracks, the Sherwin Williams that does you know, Joe, that I does did commit. See that. I okay. did see that. Okay, that does so. that does help fund this business district. We'll go with Sherwin Williams. Okay, okay. okay. that's nothing to do with the money. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, hearing that, Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Bill. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. And we look forward to serving the community even better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you just much. want everyone to know that Bill and I went to school together, so I could have put H all the way at A, but I decided <laughs> that I was going to take some retribution yeah. for some of that. Back. Yeah. <laughs> if we move back to Thank G. You all. Thanks, Billy. Um, and I think Trustee Clarity had a very good point. We should all be buying our gas at uh, our marts. Um, it's not that much difference, especially yeah, especially when you you do there. There's a pin pad that you can save another. Buy Riverside. Five cents. Yeah. May I ask, where does the village buy gas? We have our own fuel, so we purchase it at a significantly lesser I assume rate. I we did, but just worth asking. Hmm. Okay, we move on to G, a resolution authorizing a temporary use outdoor dining at London Ice Cream Shop at 38 East Avenue. Uh, Ms. Monroe. Okay. Uh, so the London Ice Cream Shop opened its doors in May of this year after a, a lengthy preparation and getting the business ready to go. It's very popular and uh, continues to see some traffic in and out of the, the doors there. Um, their hours of operation are listed as, as 11 a.m. to approximately 9 p.m. Uh, they have, for the sake of a trial period, put um, collapsible tables and chairs in uh, part of the sidewalk area, the photos of approximately where they have been placing them as well as where they should. Uh, the village board uh, approve this temporary use of our right-of-way uh, be placed along that, that stretch. Um, dining space interior is limited and so they're trying to capitalize on some exterior space. Uh, they bring the materials in in the evening and uh, put them out each day and have, uh, through their application, said that they will abide by the standards and requirements of the village for outdoor dining. So each time a new request is uh, put forward, we must bring it for uh, village board consideration and uh, before we approve their, for a permit. I have a motion to approve their permit for outdoor dining. So moved. Motion made by Trustee Gallagher. Second? Second. Second by Trustee Marshaska. Any further comments? I have a 
Yes, ma'am. Are, are these like the tables and chairs look a little bit light? Yeah. Are they just for show for the trustees, or are they going to replace those with something heavier that withstands? I think it's at a thirty. That thirty Quite pounds per square foot. Um, they they are extremely light. Uh, I we can certainly with the permit conditions um, ask them to consider a, a more hefty chairs and tables if they're planning to keep this. Um, the circumstance. I don't know the cost differential. I think it's, they probably already allocated some funds to this, and that may be significant but is it not a requirement it is a requirement of of the standards um, so if we we certainly can require it of them despite their uh, despite their other investments in in the property no well, I guess we can um, wait and see there's it, furniture blowing around absolutely <laughs> I mean it, we we have had the experience where there are other uh, outdoor dining areas where if there is furniture that's misplaced, out of place, has, has been destroyed or damaged in some way, um, we're, we're watchful, we see downtown and, and we're, we try to address it immediately. So clearly if their furniture is blowing all over the place, then they're gonna wanna replace it regardless. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Ethan. Trustee Gallagos? Aye. Trustee Mateo? Aye. Trustee Evans? Aye. Trustee Clarity? Aye. Trustee Pollock? Aye. Trustee Marshaska? Aye. Motion carries. We move on to trustee reports and cross climate communication collaborative. We will start with Trustee Marshaska. Ah, okay. So uh, you have in your packets the uh, C4 update. Uh, we had a pretty busy month with meetings and um, supplemental meetings, and uh, there's a lot that's going on um, here in Riverside, too. Next Tuesday, we have um, a community mapping activity that is going to be led by the Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, as part of our uh, asset and vulnerability uh, mapping for our plan development for the road to 2050. So it's yet another opportunity for residents to come out and share their um, knowledge of Riverside in ways that uh, both stress its benefits but also identify opportunity areas for us. So it's gonna be a really neat evening starting at 6.30 going to nine in the auditorium upstairs. Uh, and we encourage everyone who's interested to uh, register to let us know you're coming so we have enough mapping materials. Um, beyond that, uh, we also are having a 4th of July presence for the C4. So we have some residents who are going to be helping with float building and driving their electric vehicles and scooting and pedaling all for the climate. So that's gonna be a really um, fun activity for us. Uh, substantively, we are wrapping up, uh, we, I think we have the final survey in our series of six surveys that's going out this coming week. Um, and once we have all of the data from that, you will see um, also in your packets a summary of the kind of reports that we're getting. So in your packet is um, the survey data received from the um, buildings and energy survey that went out at the end of April, beginning of May. Um, and it gives a really nice image of what uh, residents felt about the top ideas from our Road to 2050 um, event in this particular uh, topic area. So this gives the um, group, uh, the C4 team locally here, an idea of what to focus on and um, pull out as recommendations for an eventual climate action and resilience plan. Um, but this is just, you know, the first phase of the multi-survey process. Um, we're, we're hoping to have a draft um, plan for you all to review by the end of the summer. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all the work it is. It's a, it's a lot of work, and thank you, Ashley, for your help also. 
Is there any other trustee reports this evening? Trustee Mateo. So you all heard about the World Nature Conservation Weekend that we're going to have here in Riverside at the end of July. Um, you know that the Audubon Society designated the River Corridor as an important bird area. And when we're doing the work to get that designation, one of the things we wanted to do is just document the diversity that we have here in terms of wildlife. But we also wanted people to get on the map and have people come here and enjoy what we have. And it's worked. Uh, Pandemic certainly helped with that. We see a lot of new faces, either riverside birders or people coming from other places. We've hosted bird walks. Last month we had about 25 people come, but they're mostly residents and it's time to expand that and invite people from other communities, part of the C4, to come and see the natural beauty and resources that Riverside has and that our staff has dedicated to preserve. So that's gonna be June 20, July 29th and 30th. We'll have bird walks in the morning. People can register through Parks and Rec so we can track how many people are coming, all ages, all skill levels. And then after they're done bird watching, they can go to lunch or rent a bike or take a paddle. Yes, Alex. They can. they can be a paddle and they can see the blue heron and some other bird's nests Segway. that you can see easily from the, from the river. Uh, we've also had some turkey vultures. I mean, we have a lot of great things to, to see out there. So I certainly encourage people to take advantage of it. Uh, this Saturday, we'll also have regular rentals for kayaks available. The river level is wonderful. We were gonna have some inclement weather, but. Uh, uh, it's, it's cleared up, so if you're waiting to, to get on those rentals, um, I would not wait very much longer. Um, tomorrow night is the first concert of the season, and the Jolly Ringwalds will be performing at Big Ballpark, so we do not miss that. And I will also make a mention that the 4th of July parade, the American Legion will be supplying our residents with 3,000 U.S. flags to wave proudly during the parade. So uh, it's summer, and we're a summer town. Very excited about the World Conservation Day. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for, for Riverside to really show off our natural resources. So thank you all for, for putting that together. I think it's great. Um, I would just mention that in about two weeks is the July 3rd, which is um, held at Guthrie Park, where many, many, many of our residents uh, come to enjoy. Um, the, this year will be, the, again, the music of uh, Libido Funk Circus. We'll have several vendors selling food and beer, so there is no reason for you to be schlepping that heavy um, cooler. So, you know, uh, please patronize the, those businesses that are there to sell. So, thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay, with that, uh, I will ask for a motion to adjourn the board does have a meeting, a need for an executive session tonight um, to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of employees or legal counsel, to discuss probable, imminent, or pending litigation, to discuss the acquisition of real property, or to discuss the sale or lease of village property. The board will not convene and no final action will take place. So again, I will ask for a motion and a second to adjourn to executive session. Moved by Trustee Mateo, second. Second. Second by Trustee Galagos. Mr. Soule. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Mateo. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazka. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you.